Welcome to the Online Great Books Podcast, brought to you by OnlineGreatBooks.com, where we talk about the good life, the great books, great conversation, and great ideas. Hello, friends. This is Brett. I am the producer of the Online Great Books Podcast. Today, you are going to be listening to part one of Scott and Carl's discussion the very first Hardy Boys book, The Tower Treasure. And like any chapter in one of those books, today's show is going to end with matters unresolved, except the last chapter in the book. So make sure you come back next week for part two. I know many of you are probably of the age where you you might have encountered these books in your youth and elementary school. I know I certainly did. Scott is a few years older than I am. Uh, He talks about having that experience. I had it as well. My dad had it, as a matter of fact. He's older than both of us. He first encountered these books in elementary school, gave me his book collection. And it was my dad's way of saying, hey, you know, life isn't Sesame Street. You know, like, let's start getting it together. Let's start getting organized here. You know, the world is filled with mysteries and uncertainties, and it's not just going to be animals singing to you about the alphabet your whole life. And you know what? My dad turned out to be right. So I have a a kind of a deep appreciation for the Hardy Boys collection. And while I would listen to Scott and Carl discuss any series of books, I'd listen to them talk about Twilight. This was special for me, and I hope it is for you as well. But even if you're unfamiliar with the Hardy Boys books, it's a nice celebration of a classic, and I hope you enjoy it. So this is part one of The Tower Treasure. Thank you for listening. I'm Scott Hambrick. I'm Carl Shute. And today on the Online Great Books Podcast, we're going to talk about the literary treasure, Franklin W. Dixon's first, whoever that is, first Hardy Boys mystery, The Tower Treasure. But before we got the microphones hot, Carl was saying that he left his playing cards in Florida. My bridge cards. What kind of bridge cards are these, Carl? Copac from Brazil. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. 15 bucks for two decks. Uh, if you've never played with plastic cards, you need to. I use uh, Kim, K-E-M, typically, but they're plastic. Which are the high-end plastic cards, Yeah, which they, are about twice the price. They're going to run you like $22 or something like that, but they last forever. We have a deck of those that we bought before our kids were born. My oldest kid's 18, and we were playing a pitch the other night in the eight of clubs. Uh, the corner chipped off of it. So we've been playing with that $25 deck of cards for probably 20 years, and they, and they, they just now need to be retired. Like it's a, they're so much easier to shuffle. They don't get dirty. Mm-hmm. They don't get all worn and wrinkled. They don't stick together. They're so awesome. It makes card playing so much more fun. And even though they're 20 whatever, how many bucks, they're a bargain because you'll go through. In the 20 years, how many decks of paper cards have you gone through? <laughs> all of them all, uh, trees worth trees worth they all just how many games do they last before something's bent so we had this this deck that we played with well for one thing the the artwork was terrible you couldn't tell what the cards were it was like um night mode right dark background but uh so we're playing we're playing bridge poorly which is the card game you need to learn i don't like card games this is the only one i like and I don't even, I'm not any good at it. So my wife and I were being partners because my two youngest daughters are bridge sharks. Yeah, they're brutal. They won't play with us. <laughs> they won't be our, our partners. But Melissa's putting her cards down. They're already bent. Yeah. What are you doing? Are you clutching it? She, no, I'm not. She's like, I'm really, I'm really nervous. From one time playing, they're crap. They're useless. Yeah. Yeah, it's really bad if you play with uh, little kids. You know, if you play cards with, you know, a 12 year old or younger, they're going to, they're going to honk them all up. It's going to be terrible. Stupid kids. Yeah, so spend a little money. If you go to the internet fora, you can find that there is a big debate, which is better, KEM or Copac. And there are partisans on both sides. I don't know which is better. I had just bought the Kim cards because that's all there was 20 years ago that I was aware of, you know. Mm-hmm. Which is better, Carl? I don't know. I don't have both. Huh. But some of the people that do the reviews are like, card magicians oh okay. and they're looking for the perfect card to do their card tricks sure but if you ever play card games the the two things to say is one learn how to play bridge you can you can actually find websites that'll uh 
show you how to do it, just the basics of how to play the game. The bidding is where the fun comes in. That's the hard thing to learn. We've got an app on the iPad called Tricky Bridge, which is kind of fun. But it's uh, my friend Scott told me that it is the chess of card games. I think that's true. I stand by that. And when I was a, uh, a kid, it was just something the old ladies played, in my experience. So we never even thought about learning bridge. It's a generational gap. They never thought to teach us. Yeah. Uh, we would go over and play with my parents, and they would remember how to play. They hadn't played in 40 years. And my dad's yelling at me, lead your trumps. <laughs> right. <laughs> He's yeah. very particular about that. You know, if you have a bunch of Trump, you're supposed to put those down first. So you draw them all from everybody else and get mad at me if I didn't. Yeah, it's the best game. Yeah. And I think 247 Bridge on the, if you just type that in your browser, I think that's a, a place you can go play and just learn how to do it without other people scolding you because you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> there will be scolding if you play it with bridge people. Holy smoke. Yeah. But whatever you do, get yourself a nice deck of cards. Yeah. Even if you play like, Pinochle or, you know, some other cockamamie game. <laughs> Go get the plastic cards. There's just so much. They just shuffle like, they're just slick and awesome. It's like a dream. Yeah, so good. Yeah. I had, we got the new cards. They came and uh, uh, my daughter Elizabeth is, is like, are you going to open them? Come on, are you going to open them? <laughs> right. Get and away from me. I said, yeah, but I get the first shuffle. Ah. And then she was disappointed. Yeah, it's like when you used to open that crappy tub of margarine and you want to get to that, that belly button looking thing off the top of that, that first that first mm -hmm. uh, s smudge of that garbage. Yeah. It's yeah, exactly like that. That's the king's portion. The king's portion. Yep. So I get the impression you're going to deuce on this book, Carl. No, there's a couple of, couple of points that I have to make. When we get done with it, there are some plot points that I, that I disagreed with. <laughs> Oh, the Hardy Boys book. All right, so so I hadn't read these in a long time, and, a, and an acquaintance of mine uh, mentioned Hardy Boys the other day. I thought, you know, that would be fun to that'd be fun to read some Hardy Boys. I haven't done it since I was eight, perhaps eight nine years old. When I first read the Hardy Boys, I read uh, the nineteen, I think it was the nineteen fifty eight versions of these books. The first edition of The Tower Treasure was written in 1927. It was not written by Franklin W. Dixon. It was written by a guy named, I think, this, this may be wrong, Leslie McFarlane, I think. And then in 1958, it was updated. Like in the 1927 edition, which I read this time, it was uh, Chet Morton's car was a roadster. You know, there's some stuff in here that's dated. And uh, by 1958, they had changed some of that. Some of that. And... Uh, and I remember, you know, the 1958 was the, my first Hardy Boys outing. I remember it more fondly. I think it was probably better and more fun. Did you read the 1958 edition? No, I have the original. I have, you might be able to find it. So Applewood Books did a facsimile edition of the originals. They, they can't publish them anymore, but you can find them used uh, because corporate took back the copyright. I actually bought a 1927 one. This is actually a 1927 one. I paid about $16 for it. Uh, so they did a, a, a real nice reprint. I like uh, seeing the ads in the back. Yeah. What books they were marketing to, to boys at the time. So I told you, dear listener, on the last show that the Hardy Boys books are why I am now a conspiratorial and bent. Both. I like to conspire, and I think everyone else is conspiring. Because I found out after I had first read the Hardy Boy books, I'd probably read, I probably read the first 20. And the first dozen are the, are the good ones, and after that, it just gets worser and worser. But I found out after I had read those that Franklin W. Dixon was no person, and it wasn't even a pseudonym for one guy. A weird business concern, I'm going to do this from memory, I believe it was called the Stratemeyer Syndicate that came up with these themes for these books and they would have like a rubric on like, how, you know, what is a Hardy Boys book, right? And they would hire writers to write these books. The gentleman, I think his name was Leslie McFarlane, maybe this is wrong, I'm going from memory, was paid $85 a piece to write these during the Great Depression. He wrote maybe the first dozen of the Tower Tri of the Hardy Boys books. Your favorite children's boys books were? Tom Swift. Tom Swift, also a Stratemeyer title. Yep. There was no Victor Appleton. Nope. 
Carolyn Keene of uh, Nancy Drew, no such thing. There were a half dozen of these titles, and they came up with a marketing scheme. Stratemeyer himself, he discovered that he could only write one book at a time, <laughs> but he could hire other people to write these books, and he could, by coming up with these clean authors, right? Franklin W. Dixon had, didn't have any titles before or after that he could sell more books. They had a rubric, you know, what is the book, right? It included a number of things, like the protagonist could never age, so as you mm-hmm. read the 100-plus titles of the Hardy Boys, Frank's always 17 and Joe's always you know 15 or whatever he is. They could never have a romantic interest, so Nancy Drew never dated. Uh, they could never – no hippie shit, if I, I believe is a quote. No hippie <laughs> shit and no drugs. <laughs> For real. From 1927? No, this uh, – Stratemeyer passed away and his daughters inherited it. One of the daughters bought – the other sister out, and in 1958, she's the one that said, hey, let's redo these and bring them up to date, which they did do. That was one of the things in her rubric. In 19, I think it was 77, uh, she was aging and sold the Stratemeyer titles to Simon Simon and Schuster. And at that time, no one knew or it was a very well kept secret that all of these books were ghost written. Each of the authors had to sign confidentiality agreements, huge penalties if if they were to uh, reveal that they had written those books and so on. But in the due diligence, I guess, in the Simon and Schuster thing, and then some litigation involved in the Simon and Schuster purchase, uh, it came out. But they kept that secret for fifty years. I mean, it might have been an industry. It might have been public knowledge sort of in the industry, but uh, all of us poor kids reading these books didn't know. None of them by Ernest Hemingway? No, not that I'm aware of. Could have been. like That would have been. What would have it been like? <laughs> a lot like this. <laughs> <laughs> Short sentences, punchy. Yeah. Yeah, so the kids never, they never age. They never have romantic interests. They never, they never have moral failings. Like, you know, it's not. Well, there was that Minx Callie. Oh, listen. <laughs> we'll talk about Callie. Um, it's not an after school special. Like the pusher man never tries to get Joe to smoke a joint. And, you know, I, I love that about him. I love that about him. Like, why not create a page turner for kids where there's no garbage in there? Like, do you need to write a children's book? Are you there, God? It's me, Margaret. Do we need that? Do we need it? Like, mm, d- does Frank blue. need to be uh, uh, groomed at the bicycle rack by the guy? Like, do we need that stuff in our children's books? No. Uh, no. no. No, I read a whole bunch of stuff. Pretty much had free reign to read what I want. And I wished I, wished I hadn't read some of it, <laughs> frankly. I read some shit too, man. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, your parents are so happy you're reading. Yeah. You know, because readers do well. And they're not paying much attention to what I was reading. When I was in the sixth grade, I think I'm pretty sure I read everything Stephen King had written to to date. That's not a good idea. Uh, no. I did a book report over James Clavell's Shogun in the sixth grade, and the teacher was horrified. She was right. <laughs> Mrs. Westrope, she's good. Yeah, yeah, I read some of that stuff too. And uh, would have been better if I hadn't. I never read Hardy Boys. I turned it in and she, she said uh, she she wouldn't t- accept it. She said, this isn't appropriate. I won't accept this. I'm like, I did it. She's like, I- I'll give you a book. So this is the kind of stuff I'm reading. And she gave me Sounder. Which I don't is know about that Like one. a coon dog. And it's a kid's book. And I was not reading kid's books. You know, she mm-hmm. could have given me like Lamort D'Arthur or like she blew it. <laughs> God, I hate to read that thing. Golly, it's terrible. I mean, I don't know that the book is terrible, but at that point I was, I had moved along. I had moved on. Yeah. Well, if you're a precocious young kid who's maybe a bit smarter than average, uh, how long can you go on Hardy Boys? I had read all the Hardy Boys I was going to read by about age eight, I would be my guess. Yeah. And so then you get, well, what am I going to read next? Well, you're going to read the more adult stuff, but the more adult stuff is more adult. But 
But you know, you can still give them adult stuff without, without it being crazy. Like I don't even want to tell you the things I read. <laughs> well, I, I, I probably read them too. You know, you can move from Hardy Boys to uh, Agatha Christie and then Sherlock Holmes maybe. You know, it's still difficult. I mean, it's difficult. It's, it's well done. It pushes your vocabulary. You know, you know, you don't have to go full full degeneracy. <laughs> but the problem yeah. is, you know, the teachers don't, don't necessarily know what to do. There was a librarian at our school, Mr. Joe Keller, who knew what to do, and he would just pile books on me, the good mm-hmm. stuff, and just pile them on me. And if I hadn't read it, he would just excoriate me. <laughs> and then he, and he piled them on, and he picked out what I should have been reading. And mm-hmm. he did a good job. And, uh, you know, uh, at that time, so I think Miss Westrope had probably talked to him. And I know my mother had. <laughs> I know my mother had. And he started piling on Isaac Asimov. Arthur C. Clarke. Mm, mm, I don't know about that, but I read all the Douglas Adams books that year that were out at that point. Mm-hmm. And then a lot of classic stuff too that, that you would expect. I think I read all the CS. <laughs> Which stuff. by the way, we ought to do, except do we just do the one? Which one? Hitchhiker's Guide. Oh, probably. I mean, we could start with one. Or Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency. Uh, you got If we got to do, we got to do Hitch, Hitchhiker's Guide. Probably. So anyway, uh, these are fun books that kids can read that, I mean, there's enough crime in them that they're exciting, but you don't feel like any of the the major people are in danger of death. The crime is all over by time Fenton, Frank, and Joe show up, or Nancy Drew shows. Yeah, it's all over. There's no gunplay between the boys and the bad guys. Now, I may be wrong about this, but it seems to me like a hobo, like you know, when they find with the treasure at the end, it seemed to me like, like a hobo or somebody had like locked them up and they had to escape or something like that. There was a little cliffhanger at the end of the, of the 1958 edition. Hmm. Not in this one. Not in this one. This, this one advertises for the next book, which I thought was funny. (laughs) Well, that was one of the things. Oh, so part of that rubric was the books had to be 200 pages plus or minus a little bit. They would write like four or five books to kick off each series and then release them all at one time. They found that their book sales per volume went up if they did that. And then they, then they had to plug the book at the next volume at the end of the, of the text. So on, but they, you know, it's very formulaic. Well, like mass paperbacks and stuff kind of, kind of showed up on the scene there in the twenties and then, you know, and, and cheaper printing processes and cheaper mechanical binding machines and so on. So book sales really went up in the, early part of the 20th century and he saw that kids were a market that were untapped and and wanted to fill that and he found a way to market to them well and they still do this now if you go to the library they call them chapter books and there'll be these series yeah goosebumps which i'm sure are not written all by the same person no imagine being eight years old and loving frank and joe because they're so freaking cool they've got motorcycles guys you don't Mm -hmm. understand like in later books they have a pilot's license. Hmm. Like they've got so much money and their dad is just cool. And they've got a freaking airplane and Callie hangs out with them and she's hot. Like in my mind, they don't even <laughs> describe her, but I'm like, she's gotta be hot. Cause she's with those guys. They got a f- fucking airplane. <laughs> so I just love it so much. And then like 18 months later, I'm like, Franklin W. Dixon's not a person. It's not even a pen name for one guy. They had like a factory writing these. I'm like, nothing's as it seems. Like, You've been writing you? fan letters to, to Franklin Fra- Dixon? Yeah. Dear Mr. Dixon, I really enjoyed your books. <laughs> I hope you will write more. Oh, my God. And so I find this out, and then I'm like, instantly, I'm like, I got to get to the bottom of this Gulf of Tonkin shit. Like, none of this stuff can be true. <laughs> Illuminati. Yeah. Yeah. What is going on? Oh, Lord. <laughs> I'm sure that's exactly what happened. It ain't far off. <laughs> they had motorcycles. Yes. In 1927. And they just have free reign. They can just ride wherever they want to. Mom packs them a lunch. And then they put yeah. it on the, in the carrier on their motorcycle. And they just strike out across the countryside. I'm like, oh, gosh, to be Frank and Joe. And they go meet with all of their friends and have a picnic. and The gang. They're chums. The gang, yeah. And my facsimile edition, I like, um, I really like the typesetting. Oh, I do too. 
it's in the days when this would have been typeset by an actual person. Yeah. Making artistic decisions on where to leave the gaps in the letters. And it's a pleasure to look at. That's another thing about the Stratemeyer books. He's like, these are going to be adult quality books. There will be nothing in the binding and printing quality that would let you know that it's a children's book. He demanded that as well. Well done, then. I like, I mean, I like the small caps and the table of contents. Yeah. It's just cool. This is how books should look. Uh, so you get yourself a copy. This is how they should look. It should have like wide margins. And the text needs to be in the center of the white space. You can't have the words going all the way to the edge of the page. We have to protect the gutters, okay? <laughs> uh, and I didn't take notes in this one because I thought my kids might want to read it. But you have to have a spot to take your notes. That's what the margin is for. You have to learn how to typeset. When I was when I was a professor, <clears throat> when I was a, an adjunct Professor of philosophy. I gave different directions to my students and everyone else did. Everyone else wanted them to ha double spaced mm -hmm. with a, you know, narrow margin. So you have text running across the page. I can't read that. I can't. You get, and you have two classes. You got 60. I only gave them five page papers because they could generally, because they wouldn't do the longer ones and they could prove whether they knew something in five pages. But that's, I mean, that, that's 300 pages I got to read. And it, you can't do it. it. It's bad for your eyes. So I would say to them, you know, inch, inch and a half margins, single spaced, you know, make it look like a Hardy Boys book. Yeah. I didn't say Hardy Boys, but it needs to look like a book. And if you get a book from about 100 years ago and look at it, that's what books should look like. They're better. They're more readable. I have strong opinions. I have a reproduction of the Sherlock Holmes stories that were published in the Strand magazine. Most of them were serialized in the Strand in London in the 1880s or what, whatever. And the typesetting is all by hand. Engravings, you know, all the illustrations are engravings. And it's just, it's what every book should be. Mm -hmm. And I read that when I was a young person. And, and I read these when I was a young person. And they're the standard. That's what I want them to be. The size of this book is proper. I just bought The Good Sumo, Carl, in, in five volumes. I don't want a great big fat, you know, 1,200 page, six and a half pound book. Your book should be th uh, no thicker than your thumb, and it should be about six by eight. Mm -hmm. If that means that Monster, Monster Hunters International, Monster Hunter International is three volumes, that's okay. Because <laughs> we're good people. Yeah, you have standards, right? Right. Beauty is important. You must not neglect the aesthetic. I bought a real life 1927. I'm so excited about this. I can't, I can't hardly contain myself. And I opened the front of it and look, it was David Ray's book. He wrote his name in the front of this. Aw. Did you look him up? No, I haven't. I, I don't, I daren't. He's, he's been dead for 30 years. Do you know where he's from? Did you get it in a... No, I bought it on store near you. I bought it on eBay. The set opens. After the help we gave Dad on that forgery case, I guess he'll begin to think that we could be detectives when we grow up. It's like right in the middle of things. Yeah. Exposition. Well, chapter one: the speed demon. Demon. After the help we mm -hmm. gave Dad on that forgery case, I guess he'll begin to think. <laughs> <laughs> it's so bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. Yeah. Paragraph three, two bright-eyed boys on motorcycles were speeding along a shore road in the sunshine of a morning in spring. It was Saturday, and they were enjoying a holiday from the Bayport High School. It's awesome. Yep, two boys, the older 16. I honestly can't tell the difference between them. Do Frank and Joe have personalities? Yeah, yeah. One of them is more prone to, to, to do fisticuffs and stuff later in the other books, you know. And, yeah. And so it's Frank Hardy and Joe Hardy, sons of Fenton Hardy, an internationally famous detective who'd made a name for himself for years, for the years he had spent on the New York police force. Now they live in a small town. They've got servants. Apparently Fenton has done well. Detective work is paying pretty well. It does pay well, we find out. Yeah, so Fenton, now at the age of 40, is handling his own practice. So Frank is 16, Joe's 15, Fenton is 40. 
So he had it when he was 25 and 26. Mm-hmm. It's a shame there aren't seven of the hard, young hardies. They could just have been a gang. Yeah. And they don't have any sisters or anything? Nope. Just the two? Yeah. Humph. Makes it easier to write. Maybe. Uh, and they get nearly run off the road by, well, somebody. A red-headed speed demon driving a yellow roadster. What is a roadster? Oh, gosh. That's just, that's going to be an a open cab, two-door automobile, right? Hmm. Like a Mazda Miata? Uh, yeah, that's probably a roadster. I'm going to Google 1927 Roadster because this is written then. Let's see what it says. Let's see what we get. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, so chances are it would have been a uh, it, chances are it would have been a Model T. Would be would be my guess. Uh, but here are a number of Roadsters. Well, I want one of those. Yeah. Probably open wheel, maybe not necessarily, but that would have had a soft top or open top. Rear wheel drive. Two, two doors. Absolutely going to be rear wheel drive. So I have, uh, on the rare occasions when I play video games, I just want to do driving games and shooting games. I don't want to think very much. Yep. We have um, Forza Motorsport. We have a nice steering wheel for it. You can drive a little car like that. And the physics are, are I, I guess, they're reasonably accurate. I can't keep that thing on the road. Yeah. It's so small. And rear wheel drive, the thing just starts to fishtail. I can't even finish the race, much less win it. So this guy's driving. He runs them off the road when he passes them in this uh, yellow roadster. And they're like, hey, I recognize that car. I think that's Chet's car. Chet Morton, their good friend. Yeah. I mean, and how cool is Chet? Like he's 16. And he's got a tea bucket. He's got like a Model T Roadster in 1927. Like these people are loaded. Well, that's part of the attraction of the book. You don't want to read about impoverished James Bond. Like you want. Yeah, him you don't to want to wear. be reading about poor people. Right. You know, my uh, my sister in law. She'll never listen to this, but she's a uh, an English teacher in the public schools. Oh. And whenever we get together, we we talk about safe topics. So we just talk about books. Right. You know, what have you read? What are you reading? And she's she's recommending to me, you know, Angela's Ashes by Frank McCourt is really, really good. I'm telling her, you know, what is it about? You know, it's about poor Irish people. Right. And I just tell her some stories of my poor Irish ancestors and say, I don't want to read those. <laughs> well, they lived it. I don't want to read it. Yeah. Uh, I want to read about rich people. Especially if when I'm reading for enjoyment, I want to imagine a world where I can just, you know, for me, it was Tom Swift, where I could have a rocket ship. Right. There, there's a pleasure in it, and it's not resentful or anything. It's just... They've got motorcycles. Uh-huh. Gosh. Chet was a great favorite with all the boys, not the least of the reason for his popularity being the fact that he had a roadster of his own in which he drove to school every day and with which he was very generous in giving rides to his friends after school hours. I want a Chet. Right. Do you want to have a friend with a pool? And uh, <laughs> It's like yeah. that line, uh, Uncle Max from the Sound of Music movies. Like, I love rich people. I love how I live when I'm with them. Right. <laughs> uh, I went to high school with this girl who had a Camaro. And. And you didn't marry her. No, no, oh, oh, no. Oh, no, no, no. She's not that one. And I'd be like, hey, listen, I'm skipping third hour. Can I take your car? She's like, yeah, here's the gas card. It's almost empty. Wow. And me and my asshole friends would all pile in this Camaro and it ditch school in her car and then go to the gas station and fill it up with her gas card. What is what? Wow. That actually happened. That is not a fib. 
Yeah, so right right here at the beginning, you know, there's trouble in Bayport. Like in Bayport, we're all we all drive prudently, right? We can let our 16-year-olds ride their motorcycles around and without worrying about anything at all in our 15-year-old. <sighs> and so this guy runs them off the road. Like that doesn't happen here. Something's afoot. And mm-hmm. they go over to Chet's house. They're like, "This looks like Chet's car." There's not very many yellow, there aren't very many yellow roadsters right here. It looks like Chet's car. So they go over to Chet's and they're like, where's your car? And he's like, it's over there in the barn. Go look. And it's gone. Ooh. The phantom criminal has crashed one car and then stole another. And so stole Chet's and drove off with it. So, you know, crime has come to Bayport. Well, it's just unlucky for him that you know, Frank and Joe are there. And so the car has been stolen, and this is on page 16 in my edition. And what do the boys do? They don't go to the cops. I know. <laughs> Come on, fellows. Let's get after him. You know, they're taking off after the criminal. We can get him. Yeah. It'll be fun. <laughs> I like that. Chet Morton's Roadster was a brilliant yellow, not easily mistaken, and the Hardy boys were confident that it would not be difficult to pick up on the trail of the auto thief. So they just take off, man. Look, they're going to catch up with this guy. This is chapter three. So we we have gotten, we know their names, and we know their dad's a detective, and we don't know anything else about them, and they're chasing a, a car thief. This is right into the action. Yeah. Page 18, we're already in a hot car chase. Well, he's in a car. We're on cycles, man. Great fun. And they stopped to ask some farmers if they'd seen a roadster, and the farmers are all slow talking, and they have to debate what's the best kind of car to have. Is it a roadster? roadster? Is it a touring car? Is it a truck? They can't get any answers out of these people. So off they go. What good's a touring car if you want to haul a load of grain into town? One of them little trucks is the best, I've always thought. (laughs) <laughs> I have to say it slower though, like old Yankees. Like, did you ever see that movie um, Funny Farm? Yeah, Chevy Chase. And the uh, you ask the old guy for directions. How do you get to such and such? He's like, you can't get there from here. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> or or you go you go by where the old Jones Farm used to be, and turn left. Yeah. Whenever I tell somebody where we live, I tell them it's over there by uh, such and such. It was a bar down the corner. I'm not going to say where it is, or somebody might be able to find out where we are. There used to be a, a tavern on the corner mm-hmm. down here from us that burned down 40 years ago. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. And you say, it's over down there on uh, Jones's Corner. And I, Oh, yeah, yeah, I know where that is. Even people that weren't alive then know where that is. So they're on this car chase. They were approaching Bayport when they saw a girl walking along the road ahead of them. There was something familiar about her appearance, and as they drew nearer, Frank's face lighted up, for he recognized the girl as Callie Shaw, who was in his own class at Bayport High School. All... Of all the girls at the school, Callie was the one most greatly admired by Frank. She was a pretty girl with brown hair and brown eyes, always neatly dressed and quick and vivacious in her manner. And this is where Hambrick was hooked. Mm. As the boys brought their motorcycles to a stop, Frank saw that Callie was not in her usual bright and cheery humor. Under one arm, she was carrying a parcel that had evidently become untied, and the paper of which was badly torn. Her face was distressed, and it appeared that she had been crying. Callie looked up and, recognizing the boys, ran over to them. That awful man, she wailed, even before they had time to ask her what the matter was. He ran right over my parcel and smashed nearly all the cakes and jelly I was bringing to Miss Willis. And with that, she held out the torn parcel. Frank knew that Callie, who was a generous and good-hearted girl, had been in the habit of taking little delicacies to a widow, Mrs. Willis, who lived just on the outskirts of Bayport. So I went to the Hardy Boys Encyclopedia, Carl. Okay. HardyBoysCaseFiles.com and looked up Callie Shaw. Listen to this. Callie Shaw is Frank Hardy's girlfriend. She was 18 years old during most of the Case file series. She had a birthday in book 126. This would make her current age 19. That means she is older than Frank and Joe. However, according to Case File number 8, she is only 17, but is close to having her 18th birthday. The Hardy Boys fandom is 
just like any other you would expect, you know. <laughs> Although she had short brown hair in Case File 1, it turned into thick blonde hair later in the series. Her hair is now medium-length blonde. She has brown, some kind of times called dark eyes. She thinks Frank looks like the actor who plays Superman in the movies. She and Frank Hardy can communicate by blinking their eyes. According to Frank, Callie is the world's most patient and understanding friend. According to Joe, Callie is a good cook. Not much is known of her family other than both her mom and dad are living. It is possible that she has a dog. Pepperoni and mushrooms are her favorite uh, type of pizza. She attended UCLA for broadcast journalism on the West Coast in or near L.A. Callie gets a bad feeling wherever she is in a parking lot. <laughs> like, what? This is so she drives a green Chevrolet Nova. In 1958. In 558. Well, that's, yeah. actually, that would have been later. Novas are 62 or something like that. Yeah, Nova was a bad... They were trying to sell those cars in Mexico. Right. And Nova means no go. It's a bad choice. I, I dated a girl for a while. It had a 63 Chevy Nova 2. And it was the two-door, the little two-door one. It had a 350 in it. And it was pretty awesome. Wow. Well, I like uh, the description of Callie from book one. I mean, she got her cakes smashed. She was taking them to the widow. She's neatly dressed. She's vivacious. You know, this is... I'm in. This is a sort of girl that need to be in your in your boy's adventure books. Right. You know, you don't want the Billie Eilish character. <laughs> the broken girl, you know. Vivacious. No. Vivacious Callie Shaw. Just the name. Callie Shaw. Yeah. Callie Shaw's lived in your imagination for years, hasn't she? Yes. I figured. Mm -mm -mm. They they run into her and then they need to go up to they actually show up at the police station and we meet the cops who are not very smart. Uh, what are the cops? Ezra, Ezra Colleg. I love the names. Con. And who's the detective? Con Riley. Detective Smuff. Oh, Smut. Smuff. And they're trying to figure out where the car is. It turns out there is a a, a, a disagreement. Did he have red hair or brown hair? He had dark hair. It was red. It was dark. It wasn't. It was. So there's some debate, you know, is it one car thief or are there two? Starting to get difficult to figure out. I got to go back to Callie. Okay. I'm, rem I'm remembering things. Callie was at the mall when the bomb went off that blew up Joe's girlfriend, Iola Morton, who was Chet's sister. Wait, Joe's girlfriend got blown up? blown up at the mall the the bad guys left they were going to try they were trying to blow up frank and joe but iola got blown up oh no yeah yeah and that's if terrible not, yeah and if i'm not mistaken that's chet's little sister is that the only girl that that joe thought was worth anything i have to go to hardy boys case files right now this is breaking my heart yeah it's rough man oh man iola doesn't make it no, I don't need that kind of shit in my life. Like, if they had killed Chet Cowley, I'd be through with Franklin W. Dixon. <laughs> wow. Yeah. There's 191 of these. Yeah. Where I, are the I, character I, things? Well, I read a lot of them. Killed in a car bomb? Ugh. Yeah. Which episode was that? Hardy Boys Case Files number one. They're the Case Files canonical? Well... See, it's no, because that's post Simon and Schuster. That's after the uh, Stratemeyer syndicate. Right. I can just look at the cover of this thing and know this. I mean, February 1989. Right. No, I'm not going to count that. Iola's alive. Okay. Uh, fair enough. I agree. No, case files don't count. But notice Hardy Boys case files number one dead on target. By Franklin W. Dixon. <laughs> <laughs> so crazy. <laughs> Man, how do you start it with... Ugh, now I'm frustrated. 
When Joe's girlfriend, Iola, is prone to bits by a bomb meant for Joe and Frank, the two brothers vow to punish her murderer. The killer is still on their trail, but before Joe and Frank can turn the tables on him, they're snatched up by the network, a secret government agency that desperately wants the Hardys under wraps for their own good. Wow. And then Joe and Frank go on a on a, mur- a murder spree, taking them out one by one, right? Just a knife to the heart That'd be through right. an ace of spades. Through an ace of spades. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. Cali. A plastic copac, ace mm. of spades. Right. I like that. That's a good callback. That's a callback, you guys. <laughs> that's how you tie that's how you tie the show together. Yeah, so I'm I refuse to believe that Iola's dead because that's that's you know, Simon and Schuster crap, so no. Nope, that didn't happen. Uh so we get to meet Dad in chapter five. These chapters are bite size. We learn about the car theft. Another thing about the rubric is that the chapter had to end, uh, you know, mid event. Each chapter has to be a, uh, a little bit of a cliffhanger. Oh yeah. That's how you write a thriller. Right. If you read my guilty pleasure, Dean Koontz, all of his chapters are about this size and they end with, and then, you know, you know, I remember stupid English teachers, you know, we would talk about, your sentence needs a subject and it needs a predicate, right? You got to have a verb and blah, blah, blah. And then you can have these clauses and so on and so on. And then they started telling us like rules for making paragraph breaks. And I was like, I've been reading some stuff. It doesn't follow these kinds of rules. I don't know what you're talking about. Mrs. Dobbs. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. And then you get to chapters, like it's just whatever you want, man. Like paragraphs, you know, you kind of want to organize them, you know, you might want to make make an you know an argument and encapsulate it in one paragraph, go into the next argument. But we're writing imaginative fiction, imaginative literature here, so like, what are the rules for paragraphization or you know making a chapter? You know, the the problem is uh, the people that Mrs. Dobbs is teaching at Catoosa Penitentiary. Minimum security facility. <laughs> Need to be able to make a paragraph. Right. And if you tell them, you know, if you're Franklin W. Dixon, you can make your paragraphs like you like. They're not going to learn. It's like in music, you got to learn your scales. But you're not going to play scales in your song. I remember her saying things like, and of course, this was 40 years ago. Uh, a paragraph is going to be roughly four sentences. The first sentence will be a, a theme, or you're going to posit a, something, and then you'll have three supporting points, and then you go to the next paragraph. You know, s- stuff like that. Like, what are you talking about? I just read Shogun. Can you imagine <laughs> trying to teach me? I, I bet they didn't. I, I didn't. I had one English teacher, Rita Van Hoos. <laughs> She told me I would never amount to anything. She like looked me right in the eye. I was in the fifth grade. She's like, "Listen, you're you're never going to amount to anything." I'm like, "All right, Rita. I'm like, you're the teacher at Katusa." I'm like, but I cut a deal with her. Like when I finished my work, it, when I was in the fifth grade, we had three teachers. So you would have one in the morning, and then you'd have uh, you'd go to like either PE or music or something like that, and you'd go to another teacher in the afternoon. And she was my morning uh, warden. And she would just give me all the work for the morning, all of it. When I'd walk in the door, I would finish it. And I would turn it in. It would take 12 minutes, and then I could leave and do anything I wanted to do. And I would typically go to the library and play chess or, you know, something like that. Mm-hmm. I, didn't, I, didn't, I couldn't borrow that Camaro yet. Yeah. They didn't teach me. If you have a kid in the school system, I was thinking of other words to say about it, and your kid is smart. And not all of them are, so maybe your kids aren't. But if your kid is smart, he is bored out of his mind. They don't have to be smart to be bored. Like, the school is boring. It's Yeah, but if he's smart, he's bored. Oh, suicidally. Yeah. You're ready to cut things and, and, Ugh, and explore Lord the God. mysteries of gasoline. <laughs> Rita Van Hoos. Yeah, we used to... <laughs> I had a friend. We used to burn stuff. It was fun. Yeah. 
to Mrs. Van Hoose's credit, it didn't take her very long to figure out that it just wasn't working between her and I. And she said, hey, you know, go, go, you know, go to the library. Get out of here. Mm -hmm. Turn your stuff in real quick. Get out of here. Yeah, you got it all done. So, yeah. Yeah, and if you if you do have one of those real sharp kids and they're in a in a school, maybe it's not the the terrible schools. Maybe it's a good maybe it's a good school. They're still going to be bored because the pace is too slow. Yeah, they'll probably hand them a stack of Hardy Boys and they'll be done with it by the end of the week. Yeah, and they'll learn more about writing. When I went through my Hardy Boys phase, I would get one out of the library at school, take it home, read it, turn it in the next day, get another one, take it home, read it. I would read them on the bus. Like we were the last kids off of the bus and the first ones on in the morning. I was on the bus for almost two hours one way because hmm. we lived way out in the boonies. And I would just read it on the bus. All right. So where are we? We're somewhere around six. Are we going to do this point by point? Ah, sure. It's a cliffhanger. <laughs> uh, they find the car. When they're off in the woods with their with their gang. Chums. Yeah. It sounds like a wonderful day. They they get food and they I love Mrs. Hardy. They just say, Mom, could you make us lunch? And Mrs. Hardy quickly made up a generous package of sandwiches, not forgetting to slip in several big slices of the boys' favorite cake. You know, that's nice. Laura. Is that her name? I believe that's right. I believe that's right. Laura. Does she get blown up in one of the Simon and Schuster ones? In my mind's eye, she's like Milf Kelly. Like <laughs> she, gosh. I was thinking Donna Reed. Uh, yeah, exactly. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> like Goodness. wearing the little A line skirt and the little apron and just like piping hot. Gets up in the morning, does her makeup and her hair, wears pumps to make sandwiches. Yeah. Like, Fenton wouldn't marry some four. <laughs> He's an internationally famous detective. We needs a, yeah. Well, she's got a, she's the woman behind him. Yeah. Right. You know, mm. making sure his tie is tied. And... Uh, here, oh, oh, listen to this. Oh, listen to this. <laughs> From HardyBoysCaseFiles.com, Laura Hardy is Frank and Joe's mother and the wife of Fenton Hardy. Laura Hardy does work for a planning commission. That's some Simon & Schuster stuff. But also has a vegetable garden. She owns a late model sedan and can use a gun. <laughs> Sounds good. I know. Is that Callie on the cover of number two? Ooh. Case Files number two, Evil Inc.? I don't know. Don't look at any. I, I'm not going to look at any pictures. No. <laughs> Because you have it in your mind. I have a mind. I have a picture in my mind. I don't need that. Yeah, she's not neatly dressed. No, she needs to be neatly dressed, carrying cakes to the widow. Yeah. That's what she's like. A pleated skirt and a cable knit sweater. That's what she will always wear in my mind. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Suggestive. It is, is it always 1985 in your mind? No, it's 1958. Ah, okay. In this book, yeah. It's 1958, yeah. Yeah, for me, it's always 1985. A suggestive cable knit sweater. Is there such... <laughs> Whatever that is. Oh, gosh. Uh, I love the description of what the boys do. This is on 47. The day passed in the usual fashion. They swam. They ate. They loafed about under the trees. They played games at imminent risk of life and limb. They explored the woods and otherwise enjoyed themselves with all the happy energy of healthy lads. Yep. Sounds great. Yeah, we used to skip school, and uh, we'd pile in one, maybe two cars, and we would drive to Spring Creek, clear gravel bottom, spring fed creek. Where is Spring Creek? Spring, it's out near Locust Grove. Yeah, I think I drove by it. Yeah, it's beautiful yeah. and it's ice cold. Like uh, I was in Spring Creek one day. We went out there and we were fishing and swimming and all that in July. It was screaming hot, like heat stroke hot. That the creek is cold, and then those clouds blew in, and it started to rain. We damn near died of hypothermia. Like there was like four of us huddled up under a tree. We were wet and just like trying to stay warm. I thought I thought we were going to die because the temperature fell to like seventy. That you were water, in imminent risk. That water it was cold. But anyway, I read this about them in Willow Grove, and we used to do stuff like that. You know, like when the world was different. Mm -hmm. So they find the car, which is neat. The car has been abandoned. Where did the thief go? Where did he go? We're not even on the main case yet. 
Oh. We're six chapters in, and we haven't even seen oh. the main caper. It's all the main caper, man. Come on. Everything's material. In the Hardy Boys world, everything makes sense if you only know, if you only have the last clue. It all makes sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, it turns out <laughs> that the Tower Mansion, which is one of the showplaces of Bayport, has been robbed the magnificent house on the hill has been robbed, and in it live uh, who lives in it? Herd, and what's the lady's name? Oh, what is it? Adelia. Adel- the yeah, maiden Adelia. aunt. Adelia. The records in Bayport City Hall gave her age as fifty-five, but Mrs. Applegate, it, Miss Applegate, admitted it to no one. She was as eccentric as her brother and lived very much to herself, being seldom seen in the city. She was at one time a blonde, but she had endeavored to retain her youth by dyeing her hair, and the result. Yeah, with the result that it was now a sort of dusty black. Chet Morton was fond of saying that Mrs. A- Miss Applegate used to be a blonde, but she died. Yeah, I'm stealing she, that line. <laughs> it's so funny. She dressed in all colors of the rainbow in her infrequent excursions into Bayport stores when she would order the clerks about like as many soldiers shouting at them in her high cracked voice and become historic on accounts of the war- wild and colorful garments she would carry off with her. And of course, her uh, her weird brother. He's a stamp collector because you know those people are those people are weird. <laughs> like Stanley, the pin collector. Yep. Which is a callback to an even earlier mm. episode. So uh, they've had what forty thousand dollars stolen in jewels and bonds, and they think, and we get a new character. They think it is the caretaker Robinson. Who's a paragon? Henry version. Robinson. That can't be true. But who else would know? Who else would know the combination? Which, mm. by the way, how did the thief know the combination? Spoiler, it's not Henry Robinson. They never said anything about it. Yeah, how'd he get in the safe? You know, thief stuff. He's a hmm. safe cracker, man. So... Uh, jewels and bonds were stolen from her Applegate's safe that only he and Mr. Robinson had the combination to. It's clearly a caretaker, Mr. Robinson, right? Oh, stay tuned. But Well, uh, I'm sitting there thinking. It's a, See, I'm I'm sitting there thinking, because I, I read different kind of mysteries in the Hardy Boys, and I'm thinking, is it an inside job? Right. Did the sister do it? Right. She had a she had an indiscretion as a younger person, and the the indiscretion was adopted away, and then is blackmailing her now, and she had to open like that kind of shit. We yeah, don't need, we don't need that. I'm, we don't need that. I'm thinking twelve steps ahead, but none of the twelve steps happen. Inflation calculator at usinflationcalculator.com. dot com. If in 1927 I purchased an item for forty thousand dollars, then in 2021 the same item would cost six hundred thirteen thousand nine hundred seventeen dollars and change. A cumulative rate of inflation of one thousand four hundred thirty four percent, which I don't believe. I believe it's been higher. So three quarters of a million dollars have been stolen essentially in 2021 money. Yeah, that's a fair amount. You would notice that. Leave the mark. Uh, so Robinson m- must be guilty because he's the one who knows it, and also because he had that nine hundred bucks that he couldn't explain. Uh, I forget all the details on that. There's nine hundred bucks that he can't he can't say what it is, and so he looks guilty. He says, "I got it honestly, but I'm not at liberty to te- liberty to tell you how I got it. Not yet, at least." Which is interesting. So, Car- Carl. Mr. Applegate and Miss Applegate are sanctimonious old ninnies. Yes. Only one man in the world could have taken it. Robinson. He's the man. And then later on, the boys have reason to believe that the treasure is actually hidden in the old tower. And they try to get them to Mr. Applegate and uh, Miss Applegate to allow them to search the old tower and they're like, you're trying to make a fool out of me. I'm like, I'm like, what are you talking about? How could letting, how could them searching the old tower make you out to be a fool? They're, they're this caricature that you see in these old books and in old movies of this sort of stodgy, this stodgy kind of person. Was that actually a type? You know, that just resisted hmm. everything and dug their heels in? Because now we have, 
we have types now that are, are incomprehensible to me. We have like the soy boy, trust the science guy, Redditor. You know, I'm like, what is this guy? And they behave in a predictable way. You've got the, the weird MAGA guy, and he acts in a predictable way. And like, there are types that exist that, I, that I'd never even seen before. Like, I wonder if there were actually like this sort of upper middle class New Englander that just frankly just shit on everybody all the time and didn't believe anybody ever said anything that was true. Well, the Applegates, did we get, where did they get their money? Uh, Are they old money? Yeah, the, da- the dad was like a, I can't remember. Listen, I'm going to have to go to hardyboycasefiles.com and look up Heard Applegate. <laughs> the indispensable Hardy Boys encyclopedia. No results found. This is some Simon and Schuster garbage right here. <laughs> How dare they? But on hardyboys.fandom.com. He's oh, yeah. Major Applegate, an eccentric old army man who'd made millions by lucky real estate deals. There you go. At last, there only remained Herd Applegate and his sister, Adelia, who continued living in the vast and lonely old mansion. So I'm thinking about that weird thing that you have on the western edge of Oklahoma. In Ponca City, that oh, mansion. The, the Marler Mansion, yeah. Yeah, just an old family with money that gets weirder and weirder. Yeah, they're out there. You know that guy married his daughter. Yeah, sort of. Adopted daughter. Yeah, he did a, um, a Woody Allen. <laughs> yeah, oh, he pulled a Woody Allen. Have I got a story for you? My uncle Henry. I don't know. Have you? Yes, I do. My uncle Henry married Carol. His father had died. My grandfather had died in the late fifties, and he married Carol in the mid sixties. My grandmother had been widowed then for some time. After Uncle Henry married Carol, my grandmother married her father. Who by, a, <laughs> who by all accounts was a great guy. And he got cancer and passed away. Hmm. Dog on it. Later on, she marries a guy named Al. My grandmother married a guy named Al. Some years later, Uncle Henry married another Carol who was in fact Al's daughter. So my uncle likes to tell everybody he's been married twice at both times to his sister. <laughs> what do they say? Is that, is that country AF? Yeah. <laughs> if that ain't country. Yeah. Well, you know, people used to marry who they knew. Yeah. Like I mean, well, I mean, of course yeah. you marry some. You don't marry a stranger, but people used to marry people in their their circle of acquaintance, which, did, which didn't used to be as big. I think we've got we've got first cousins up there in the family tree. My uncle Everett yeah. married my aunt Pat. His cousin married her sister. Th- th- that's who they knew, right, Uncle Everett? Yeah, we got a family where there were twin sisters, and the around here, and two brothers married the the two sisters. And they both had a whole bunch of kids. So there's all these, uh, I don't want to say their names, all these Browns, the Brown family. <laughs> right. You know, that are genetically identical. <laughs> <laughs> right. They're, they are each other's double cousins. We're cousins on both sides. Yeah. No inbreeding, actually. In a small town, that's what you would do. Right. Especially if Callie Shaw is there. Like, I don't care whose cousin <laughs> Callie Shaw is. So so the Hardy Boys are super upset. Like, a couple of bad, bad things have happened. One, somebody made Callie cry, and I ain't standing for that. Two, mm-hmm. they were run off the road by the same dude who made Callie cry. Three, he rode them off, drove them off the road and made Callie cry while driving their best friend's stolen automobile. This is so bad. And then, and then somebody, all in the same day, the like same couple of days, steals some stuff from the Apple Gates, which, you know, nobody's super fond of them anyway. But their other friend, Perry's dad, worked for the Apple Gates. Apple Gate accuses Perry's dad of stealing this money, and the Perry's have got a bunch of kids, and they're not super well off, and they don't know what they're going to do because uh, Mr. Applegate fires Perry's dad, Mr. Robinson, and their boneheaded Amos and Andy weird 
uh, police department jails the guy, essentially because Mr. Applegate tells him to. Mm-hmm. So the Hardy Boys. Yep, and Perry's got to quit school and go to work, and he won't ever be a lawyer, which I didn't think was a bad thing, but... No. So the Hardy Boys are taking this personally, and everybody knows you don't make Frank and Joe mad. They will bring you to justice. 